My name is Nicole Ramos. I direct the Border Rights Project of Al Otro Lado, which is a binational organization at the US-Mexico border that works with asylum seekers trying to enter the US and those that are detained in US immigration prison. Over the last several years, since 2017, we have served over 30,000 asylum seekers from over 50 countries speaking over 17 different languages. And over the course of that service, we have served tens of thousands of families. The right to be with one's family is basic, it's natural. We see it discussed in international human rights instruments, and it is a feature of the domestic law of many nations, including the United States. However, that right all but disappears for migrants who are attempting to seek asylum at the US-Mexico border. And what is critical that we remember as we discuss the different kinds of family separation that are happening is that they are being committed by the US government, which is a nation which holds itself out to be a nation of family values and a champion of human rights. As an American and as a lawyer practicing at the US-Mexico border, I want to tell you that that image that the US government would have us all believe is in fact a lie. A lot of people, when they think about family separation and the United States, they think about the family separation crisis of 2018, when the Trump administration announced the zero tolerance policy through which US immigration officers forcibly ripped screaming and crying children from the arms of their asylum seeking parents. And it did not matter whether they entered illegally or whether they tried seeking asylum more formally at a recognized US port of entry by presenting themselves to US immigration officers. Both families entering through both type, type both means were separated. Of course, that's not the first time that the US government has separated children from their parents. We do not look that far back in history at the forcible separation of indigenous children from their communities and their parents where they were forced into boarding schools and forbidden from speaking their language or engaging in their cultural practices. Or when we forcibly separated the children of slaves from their parents, selling them off to other slaveholders. But beyond those more common examples of family separation orchestrated by the US government, the government of family values and human rights, we have other types of family separation which are just as equally devastating because they threaten what is the core of all cultures and all societies and that is the family. It's extremely common for US immigration officers to separate the father of a family from the rest of his family members, including his wife and children, and to send him to an immigrant prison thousands of miles away while the rest of the family is given a conditional entry to the country for the purpose of seeking asylum. What is the impact of this separation outside the devastating emotional and psychological toll? Dad is going to be forced to fight his asylum case from inside the prison where he will very likely be forced to do labor by the private prison corporations that manage the majority of these immigration prisons. He will most likely not have access to a lawyer because there is a dearth of lawyers able to provide free representation. And asylum cases can run anywhere from 5,000 to upwards of $20,000, a fee which is far outside the reach of most immigrant families, especially families where one of the wage earners has been taken out of the equation. Because asylum law in the US is exceedingly complex and frequently changing at the whims of whatever administration is in power, an attorney is absolutely vital to having any chance of being successful in the asylum case. And if the father does not have a lawyer, he almost will certainly lose his asylum case and be deported back to the country's, the family's country of origin. Now, some fathers will try to come back and make it across the river or the desert to reunite with their family. Some fathers are so broken 
by the process that they will remain in home country and try to start their lives anew, maybe start a new family. Some fathers are going to be killed in their home country by the same people and forces that the family was trying to flee in the first place. And some of those fathers that do try to make the journey back to the U.S. to enter illegally um, will die in that journey, either in Mexico or die in the desert trying to cross. In all of these outcomes that I have just put forth, the family which entered the U.S. intact is forever destroyed and with psychological damage that can never be undone. We also see similar patterns of separation with elderly family members, such as grandparents, other adult family members not traveling with minor children of their own, such as a cousin, an aunt, or an uncle, as well as adult children, even those as young as 18 years old and one day who have never spent a night apart from their parents in their entire lives. We see these adult family members with no minor children forcibly separated from the families they migrated with, the families who were ultimately given a conditional release into the United States. And these adult family members are transferred to immigrant prisons, often thousands of miles away from their family members who are given no information about where their imprisoned family member is being held. In one case, which I remember vividly, a uh, Guatemalan family came. Um, it was a mother, two minor children, one 18-year-old daughter, and a grandmother. Now, the father of this family had been murdered in Guatemala by the same gang that this family was trying to flee. And upon presenting themselves at a U.S. port of entry to seek asylum the formal way, the 18-year-old daughter and the grandmother were sent to an immigration prison and imprisoned there for a little over six months before we could ultimately secure their release. I saw a young girl who left Guatemala in high school in a prison uniform. I saw a grandmother who was a homemaker her whole life, who had never been to school, who could not read, who was losing her eyesight due to old age, who had never lived apart from her family her whole life, treated like a criminal and forced to sleep in a cell under guard. And over the six months that grandmother and granddaughter were detained, I watched them deteriorate psychologically and physically and come so close to wanting to give up, to signing their deportation because they couldn't take the separation anymore. There is no reason for these separations because to be separated from your family by immigration officers at the border, it does not require the immigrant to have a criminal history or even a deportation history. Many people believe that we are only imprisoning immigrants who pose a danger to the US, who have serious criminal histories, who are engaged in repeated violations of US immigration laws. But for the vast majority of the hundreds of thousands of immigrants that have been separated from their families as they have attempted to seek asylum at the US-Mexico border, this has not been the case. We have seen thousands of immigrants with no history whatsoever separated from their families and detained. In this current moment at the US-Mexico border, we have a policy called Title 42, which prevents asylum seekers from entering the US under the guise that it will keep us safer. Even though hundreds of thousands, and I would even hazard a guess millions of Americans in the US refuse to wear a mask and refuse to be vaccinated. Even though immigrants who have a travel visa or a student visa are able to enter the US freely, even though US citizens and legal permanent residents are able to travel across the border as many times a day as they can fit in 24 hours without a mask and without being vaccinated and without being subject to health screening upon entry. All of these people have freedom of movement, but asylum seekers are prevented from entering to the U US under Title 42 to keep us safer from COVID. 
Those migrants who attempt to enter at this, during this time are promptly expelled back to Mexico, and in some cases, expelled without any interview back to their countries of origin. Only those who have been granted an exemption from the policy through a very limited and time-consuming process that may take months and in some cases years may be given access to the asylum system. We have seen under this expulsion policy, families separated which in ways which defy logic and humanity, including the separation of couples, married couples who uh, arrive at the border with their marriage certificate, where one spouse is given a conditional release into the US to seek asylum and the other spouse is promptly expelled back to Mexico or their country of origin. We have seen parents with two or more children separated, whereby one parent is released with one child into the US and the other parent and the other child is returned to Mexico, including the separation of breastfeeding infants from their mothers who are expelled back to Mexico with their fathers. We have seen families who are traveling with unaccompanied minors who essentially there are children who are not traveling with their biological parents, they're traveling with their caregivers, usually a grandparent, an aunt, uncle, cousin, or older sibling, who are routinely separated from their caregivers, even where it is the only caregiver that that child may have known for the entirety of their life. Or even with that caregiver has legal documentation showing that they are the legal guardian of that child. These children are separated from their caregivers and they are sent to government-run shelters for migrant children who arrived traveling alone. These children are treated as if they traveled with no family at all. And it may take weeks and it may take months for those children to ultimately be reunited with family in the U.S. And if their caregiver arrived to the U.S. without any minor children of their own, it is very likely that that caregiver will be sent to an adult detention center thousands of miles away and given no information about where the child that they have raised has been taken to. And it may be very possible that that caregiver who may have no access to an attorney or funds to hire an attorney will proceed with their immigration case in the detention center where they will ultimately lose and be deported back to the country of origin and separated from that child for the rest of their lives. Even though the US government has the authority to place child welfare workers from the Office of Refugee Resettlement at the border, at ports of entry, to make the best interest of the child determinations and evaluations to determine if that child is safe in the care of that adult family member. And we know that this is possible because this is exactly what the US government did when we saw the exodus of Ukrainians arriving in Tijuana in March and April of this year, where we processed over 20,000 Ukrainians in the span of six weeks, in some cases, more than a thousand a day. And while there were some family separations, there were much fewer by far. The vast majority of those families were able to migrate intact, including those families with unaccompanied minors. That is because the US government placed those child welfare workers at the ports of entry to make those determinations. What is the difference between the Ukrainian asylum seekers that arrived at our border and those asylum seekers arriving from Guatemala, from Haiti, from El Salvador. The difference is the color of their skin. The difference is the Ukrainians are white. Some of you might be asking, what is the legal justification? What is the reason? Surely this woman it must be fanatical or mistaken, um, but it is no mistake. I have worked at the border for the last eight years, and cruelty is the point. Deterrence of migration is the point. Instilling fear in order to discourage migrants from exercising 
their international legal right to seek asylum is the point. Breaking the spirit of families is the point because the vast majority of these migrants are coming from black and brown countries, which threatens a white majority in the United States, which is a population with a declining birth rate. And deterring migration essentially preserves that white majority. White supremacy is the reason and holding on to power is the point and asylum seeking families are the victims. I have held the hands of too many fathers in detention centers, too many adult children, too many grandparents split by this border and the policies of family separation. I have borne witness to too many tears to the psychological and physical deterioration of these families. And if I sound emotional, if I sound angry, it is because I am filled with rage because my government is torturing families for no reason other than deterrence motivated by racism. We are victimizing families who have come to us as victims seeking protection. And we are telling you, the rest of the world, with a straight face, bold face lies about who we really are. It does not have to be this way. This is simply the path that the US government has chosen. That concludes my remarks for this morning. And, and now I will keep it open for questions. Nicole, do you speak Spanish? Sí. No. Es que quiero decir esto en español. Muchas. Just a little bit. No, no, I'll, no, I'll no, translate no. that. Y Dios bendiga tu trabajo. Thank you for everything you have done and God bless your, your job. I have a question. Um, I know that professionals who give their life to serve immigrants are following a deep call to give their lives, the best of their lives to, to help the less favored. Uh, migration stories can be deeply moving. There's a, a, a book called Cuídate para cuidar a otros, which means take care of yourself before taking care of others. Uh, in this book, uh, well, among other things, they try to prevent uh, the burnout syndrome. I just want to ask, how do people working in your project take care of themselves in order to be okay to help others? Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Honiko. We discuss burnout a lot as an organization. We have um, a, a relatively small organization for all of our projects. In our border rights project in Tijuana, we have a staff of 15, um, but we work with around anywhere, depending on the semester, 60 to 100 student volunteers. Um, we have weekly check-in processing sessions, which are not mandatory. Um, some people prefer to process alone where staff and volunteers can come and talk about some of the difficult feelings that they are experiencing from this work. We have a uh, flex time. So if you had extra hours that you worked on one day, you can work less hours on another day. Um, we have a really generous leave policy. Um, we have two forms of insurance to provide um, mental health counseling and then additional mental health support. Um, we have other activities where we invite speakers um, or holistic health providers to come in and provide services to staff. Um, a lot of our staff um, are impacted persons by they've um, had immigration stories in either their, their personal journey or with their family. Um, I myself came to Mexico because my partner um, at that time, who's now deceased, um, was deported from the United States. Um, and, you know, this is a, a very emotional topic for a lot of us, but it is something that we are deeply moved by because it is our communities that we are protecting and fighting for. I admire you for your strength and that I am really impressed because you are the proof that change can be made. I just want to say that really I, I recognize and admire all your effort and I look forward to someday do something um, like you do, maybe from another perspective, but make the change. So 
what I would like to say in, um, after that is that I think that something that you said that is really hard to hear is you said the only difference between the migrants that, that come from Ukraine and the ones that come from Latin America is the color of their skin. I think that that is because we come, uh, especially uh, Latin America, we come, we were uh, once conquered or by other countries and we have to, to make a promise, a process of decolonization. I don't know how to say it in English, but we have a Eurocentric point of view of what is beautiful, what is right. And because we don't fit with those stereotypes, we tend to believe and other people tend to see people that come from Latin America as inferiors. I have the privilege to be a white male, but I know that we, I have that privilege. And I think that in order to make a real change, we have to make this process of decolonization, decolonization, to understand that those stereotypes, that those Eurocentric points of views are not the ones that are correct. Um, and I think that I love what you're doing. I think that, and that's why I'm here, because I, I think that the, the key to to make a change is in family, is in, is the, the key to make this change is to educate the children to never have this point of view that white people are better than others. And I think that we, if we are able to change that, then in the future, there's not, there's not going to be a need in order to, to make this movement to raise the voice because there will not, there will not be something to raise the voice for. I think that the key to, to change this is the education. And I think that that's in the family. But I just want to say that I love what you said. I truly admire you. You are someone that's really, really, really worthy of, of admiration. And I just want to thank you a lot. And just uh, wish you the best. I, you, I am going to, to pedir por ti and ask for you. And I just want to say that simply, wow, really, thank you for everything. I hope to hear, to keep hearing from you. I hope that you have a really nice life. And I hope that you can make the change that you, that you desire. It was really interesting. And I really empathize with your cause. It is something that we can do together. Just let me know. And also, uh, I want to make a clap for her because the thing that it's doing here is really, really important here. And I think that the vulnerable groups and all are all like um, separate because of the color of the skin, as my teammate uh, talk about it. So really, thank you. Uh, God bless you in anything you do. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I, I just wanted to make a, a shameless plug before my time is up. Um, we are always accepting volunteers. We have a lot of remote volunteers from not just the US, but from all over the world. Um, that's how we're able to serve tens of thousands of people each year with a really small team. Um, we do provide training. Being a lawyer is not required. Um, and um, I will put my email in the chat. If anyone is interested in volunteering, please feel free to send me an email. Um, thank you so much for your time and this invitation this morning.